there are very evasive, dishonest, sinful ways of engaging in discussion, especially public discussion, that many have adopted as holy. Many Christians in the evangelical world have ideas about what's right and good in public discussion that are actually evil and sinful. And we want to draw attention to that. And, and so sometimes we're going to be as harsh, maybe even harsher with someone who we agree with to many extents than we are with somebody who we really, really sharply disagree with. But so let, let me give you an example. Th there could be somebody that is arguing for I don't know, abortion, who is engaging in to a certain extent, a more honest form of argumentation than someone who is arguing for free market economics that I agree with. Just by, by stating the premises clearly and inviting feedback on their premises versus just saying, throwing out random things that, that uh, catch the audience's attention, but not making a coherent argument and by equivocating on a number of things. We ought to be harsh against dishonest methods, underhanded ways, in addition to being harsh against evil ideas. So Cody, do you have that example that maybe you could uh, bring up or I can bring it up here? I don't have it pulled up, but what I do recall was that uh, he had made a, a minor objection to what you said and sort of insulted you. And then you said, well, here's the answer. And then he responded and said, I have no interest in discussing this with you, but he's already, he's already shown that he has interest in at least like showing off his knowledge a little bit. So that's, yeah, but, that's inconsistent. Yeah. I've got to pull up here. So ba basically this is about the Westminster larger catechism thing where we were talking about, you know, a Marxist view of property. And uh, he, he says, I mean, he already talking about me called the Westminster larger catechism Marxist. And by implication, basically all the reformers. So dot, dot, dot. And I asked him the, the clarifying question, is it theft from human beings to not give charitably to them when they are in need, which is the, the point of issue, yes or no? And, and he says, I have literally zero interest in debating this over this with you. And, and then my response was, then shut your mouth and go away, right? So, and, and people were shocked that I said, shut your mouth and go away like that. Oh my gosh, that, that's so rude. You know, I, I would never say that to somebody, especially in public, right? That seems so rude. But like I said in a post later, I was kind of shocked people were so shocked uh, be, because I assumed wrongly, apparently, that people would be much more shocked by his behavior there. He is essentially saying, I want to mock your position, but I, I have no desire in engaging your position. And it's like, yeah. well, it's one or the other. You have to choose. That's dishonest. It is fundamentally dishonest to, and I would say sinful, to publicly mock somebody's position while refusing to engage their position. It's one or the other. Either you have no interest in the position, which means you should shut your mouth and go away, or you want to talk about the position, which means you ought to engage it. And he was trying to have it both ways. He was trying to say, I want to mock you, all, you know, as freely as I want, but I don't want to have the responsibility of engaging with anything that you have to say. As you're describing that situation, it comes to my mind that there might be a time where you know somebody is a liar. And I mean, so for example, let's say Jim Artis be the liar, the false accuser, the, well, the false witness. That's Jim Artisby's entire persona. Let's say he were to make a, a comment and I were to like do a repost and say, see, this is a lie. This is obviously a lie. And that's all I said. And then he says, well, where's the lie? I might not respond to Jamar Tisby, but if anybody else comes in and asks like, hey, why aren't you responding to him? I'll say, well, because he's a known liar and I'll give him like 17 examples. I mean, I, I have no problem showing the reasons for what I'm doing. And I think that that's where, that's where it, it breaks down. At some point when you think that somebody is badly motivated and they're, they're not seeking the truth, it would be okay, I think, to say, I'm, I'm not going to talk back and forth with you right here. I think you're a liar. That's all I have to say to you. Yeah, and, and that's fine. I, to my knowledge, I don't believe that's what this guy was saying about me. Uh, no, no, because obviously he thinks 
I mean, from from what he said, and from the interaction you had, it's clear that he just thinks you're making an error. He doesn't think you're lying on purpose. He doesn't think you're badly motivated necessarily. He just thinks you're dumb, right? And if mm-hmm. you if you're going to go in public and say, I think this guy who's done a lot of work on this issue and written articles about it and has a master's degree on these topics, he's going to go and say this thing and then I'm going to say it's dumb. And he's going to say, well, I don't understand. Can we engage? And then you cut it off. It's just, it's rude. I, I'm not going to say that there's like a, a standard that you always must respond. Uh, I agree. Absent a a consistent track record that you are able to cite of that person being dishonest right and 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 the funny thing is is here this would be an example of this guy being dishonest right and so and if he engaged like this multiple times then then i would be justified in doing to him what he's doing to me right here right where where he he's you know saying something and then and i say you know i'm not even gonna engage you i have no i desire to engage you uh because of this track record of here's this, here's this, here's this. And then, you know, and in that case, say you've got two people claiming the same thing about each other, right? So say I was claiming he's bit, he's got a track record of being dishonest. He's claiming I've got a track record of being dishonest. Then you, you just have to present both sides and let people decide on their own and let the chips fall where they may and, and, and then move on. And that, you know, and that's all you can do. But absent that, absent a claim, a, a consistent track record of dishonesty, the expectation should be if you are going to seek the privilege of of publicly mocking or publicly criticizing a person or an idea then you ought to also assume the responsibility of engaging with that person or that idea on the topic that that's in question in order to combat this dishonest trend, one thing I recently came up with is a hashtag Cody Leibolt's list on Twitter. And just I'm just going to use that at the end of any discussion where I ask a decent question and somebody just checks out of the conversation. And this has happened you know, with James White on the definition of presuppositionalism. It's happened with Joel Berry, who claimed that it's selfish and self-interested to have an abortion. And I was like, well, we should discuss this. And it happens from time to time with other people, with John Watkins about abortion you know, just he, he ad hominem to me and checked out of the conversation, unfortunately. And so I'm going to use that in order to just remind if I ever need to go back and find them all like these, this is where we picked up last time, my friend, if you would like to go back to the question that you abandoned last time, this is where the discussion sits. Mm -hmm. Because people are so dishonest with their use of their use of deciding, oh, I, I need to go on a bike right now. Like, I really, you know, I've already insulted you 17 times and answered zero of your questions, but now I'm gone. Yeah, and, and the funny thing is, is often in their mind, they're thinking, man, I, I've i just, I've spent too much time on this guy. He's just too dense. When really they haven't answered a single question or given a straight answer about anything. They've just evaded the whole time. Uh, but to them, they, they think, man, I've, I went through a lot of work here. Right, <laughs> so that's why it's, it's, it's nice that it's public and other people can be the judge of whether or not it was an honest attempt. Mm-hmm. Let's move through several more objections and we'll wrap it up. Yep. The, uh, so, so here's one is, how do you know that you're picking the right battle? And how do you know that you are sufficiently educated to enter that specific battle? I, I don't recall that particular objection. Is there more to the context or an example? There was, uh, but this, okay, so this is from one of our patrons and he says about somebody who was not criticizing Albert Moeller. He says, Maybe it's just not in his wheelhouse to discuss whether or not Albert Moeller is a good guy or a bad guy. And maybe he's engaged in other battles against anti-Trinitarians or Pelagians. So, so how do we know when somebody's picking the right battles? What's our standard for that? And then is there a certain threshold of education or being informed that has to be reached before you would expect a Christian to confront an issue or before you are entitled to confront an issue? Yeah, so for, to the first, you know, with Moeller as the example, and let's, I, I don't know who he was talking about, but let's just say it was James White. Is it legitimate to say, well, James White isn't in the SBC, he doesn't have enough information about Moeller, and so therefore, you know, it's understandable that James White wouldn't criticize Moeller for his inaction with his woke professors or whatever. Problem is that there, there's no insider knowledge necessary for what we are claiming about Moeller. His professors have taught things that are obviously 
false and dangerous, according to James White, right? Or, or according to whoever, take your pick. We, we wouldn't be making this criticism of somebody who wouldn't agree with us about the danger of what Matt Hall and Jarvis Williams have said. By their own standard, the teaching is dangerous and it's public. Th- then the, the next point is, well, Mueller is in a position of authority over those men and he's in a position where he could put a stop to the public acceptance of their ideas by simply publicly criticizing them and publicly warning against them, right? He could, and he's choosing not to. That's it. That's the full criticism that Mueller ought to, and he's choosing not to. Now, the, the only thing that they claim is complicated about it is some might think might claim as James White appears to that there might be some justification for Mueller doing it other than Mueller being woke himself right and so I think there's a there's a misunderstanding about what we're claiming we're not claiming that Mueller himself is woke or that he sympathizes with the woke teachings of Matt Hall and Jarvis Williams I don't know if that's the case it might be the case I doubt it I think most likely James White is right that Mueller just has certain political motives in mind. But that doesn't make it okay. And, and, and that's that's the issue. Even if White is right, if I and James White both had the opportunity to sit down with Mueller and Mueller were able to explain to us in secret that you know the reason he hasn't condemned them yet is because he's hoping to gain the presidency so that he can do this, so that he can do that. What, what are the cases, right? Even if we had all of the secret knowledge and even if all the secret knowledge was as charitable as possible to Mueller, I think it's righteous that you would still leave that discussion and say, you're wrong, Mueller. There is no holy justification for refusing to warn the people of God about false teaching that is going out under your name and under your leadership. That's it. It's that simple, right? Now, someone might disagree with me about that. Like, you know, maybe James White disagrees about that. Maybe James White would say, no, you don't have a moral obligation to warn the people of God about false teaching going out under your leadership if you've got some other pragmatic aim in mind. James White might claim that. I don't know. If he, if he does think that, I wish he would say it publicly. And then we could debate that issue, Right. But, but I don't think that's what he's saying. I, I think he's trying to imply that there's, you know, that he's sort of just assuming that that might be the case. And then implying that, well, maybe there's secret knowledge that we don't know about, so let's just shut up. And, and, and all I'm saying is the secret knowledge wouldn't make a difference on the matter one way or the other. So, and, and then to the, the second part of the question, I think it was, how do you know if you have enough knowledge or expertise or if somebody else has enough knowledge or expertise to speak to a certain issue? I think it's a legitimate concern. And I mean, you have to take it on a case by case basis, uh, but you, you, you know that you have enough knowledge if you know what's true. Like if, if, you've, if you've thought through it and you are confident in the conclusions that you've come to and you've tested it against other sides, uh, especially if there's another prominent side, You've tested it, and it's it's proven itself. Then you're in a position to say this is right, and here's why so and so ought to agree with me on this. It's not a matter of credentials. It's a matter of of thinking through it, being exhaustive, and and being open to criticism. I still have that that position toward many people who I disagree with about many things, you know, including people like James White on presuppositionalism, for example. You know, if, if I'm missing something about what Van Til taught, I don't think I am, right? If I'm missing something about his view, let me know, tell me, right? And I mean, Cody and I do this all the time. You know, people say, you're misunderstanding Van Til. You haven't read this, you know, hundredth book of his 13th disciple. Well, point out in that book where the point of contention is addressed. And then I'll, I'll read that. But contrary to what some people might have you believe, you don't have to have read every single piece of literature on a topic in order to speak objectively or even authoritatively on that topic.
right? It, you, you, can, you can speak objectively and authoritatively within the context of your knowledge while also saying, now, if I'm wrong, correct me. But you, you have to actually show me where I'm wrong. You can't just assert that I'm wrong and expect me to accept that. You, you, have, to, you have to show me where I made an error such that I can follow your train of reasoning to correct the error if I agree that I was in fact an error. I wanted to share a quote with you from Andrew Sandlin. This is one that I strongly agree with. We sometimes hear that the church is a hospital. Wrong. The church is an army. An army might build a hospital, but armies aren't formed to build hospitals. They're formed to win battles. So I've heard this line about the church is a the church is a hospital, not a museum, used to advocate for why people should not have these polemical discussions. Because if you have these polemical discussions, then many of the people in the church who were not raised in the faith, and for example, they think that voting for Democrats is actually the higher moral position, they're going to be confused about, you know, about the gospel and Jesus if, if they hear you talking about things in a polemical manner. And I'm thinking that's a strange excuse because first of all, the church is not a hospital, like Sandlin said. Uh, we, we ought to be an army. We, we ought, I mean, there are children out there that are being forcibly taken away from their parents. The parents are being forced to pay for the indoctrination of those children while those children are told that they're gay. And we haven't even mustered up the courage to go to the school board meetings and to denounce these people as wicked criminals. Like what kind of army are we? That's the context that we're living in. We live in a time of war. And sadly, this concept of, you know, the church is a hospital. It's not supposed to be a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. This line is being used as a justification for silencing those who believe in polemics, those who believe in fighting back against the injustices and protecting their own children and defending their own nation. Sadly, most churches would rather kick out me than kick out somebody who says you should vote for Democrats. Because I said you shouldn't say that, and you're not even behaving as a Christian if you say that. That's enough to call me divisive. We have an absolute lack of moral reasoning, and a shameful lack of moral reasoning. And because that's true, I can agree with Jude. I can speak of the shame. I can speak words of condemnation. I can tell you that condemnation is morally necessary, and I can know that this is the case. I want to throw in a point here. Strong, specific moral condemnation, moral language, judgment is an application of the rational egoism that we always advocate at Christian intellectual. It's not suitable for men who hate their life, but it is necessary for men who love their lives and who love their families. So get out of our way or join us. Those would be your good choices. Listen, the strategy for winning culture wars is as follows. Recognize that you're in a culture war. And it's going to turn into a real war soon if you do not begin today to engage in wartime polemics. Two, instead of saying that something is bad, say, this is bad and I'm going to destroy your reputation for advocating it and trying to force it on me. Three, instead of saying, join my battle, my friends, as I combat this and promote this, say, you better declare your support for this battle against these villains, or your reputation will also suffer damage. In other words, be like the Holy Spirit, who inspired King Saul on that day. If you don't wake up and join this battle, we're going to make sure that the whole world knows what a coward you are. Mobilize. Consider the threat of the American Library Association putting pornography in school libraries not letting parents in the libraries to find out that it's in there. Siding against the parents, calling parents terrorists. Look, if you want to call yourself an ally in the culture war, an ally of God's people, you're going to need to stop playing the part of a coward. You're going to need to identify right from wrong. It's going to involve calling out our own. Censure. Censure like in in the time of King Saul. Join this battle. If you stay home in this battle, it's not going to go well for you. I'm not saying that we have to chop up a heifer and send it to all the corners of Israel and say, look at this heifer. 
that I'm going to, so I'm going to do to your heifers if, if you don't join my battle. It doesn't have to be that, but it does have to be some level of accountability, some level of censure, depending on whether people are willing to participate. And one of the places it has to start is churches. Pastors who will not support polemics are not worthy of your funds. Pastors who kick out those who are engaged in the culture war, but invite those who are succumbing to the culture war, those who are fighting on the wrong side of the culture war, need to be kicked out of their churches. That's one of the ways that accountability is going to come to our country. Look, I don't believe that we need to have 100% of people agreeing with everything that we say. But I believe that a very small fraction of people, 5 10% of people, taking a stand and saying, we believe in this so strongly that we call everyone else to join us in our cause. And if you don't, that's going to be a problem for me. That's the kind of thing that we need to be saying. Jacob, do you think I'm on the right track here? I do. Uh, and, and this goes back to the issue of, you know, we, we are not just minds. We are not just sterile academics. We are human beings with affections and we are meant to glorify God in all of our lives. So it, Christian truth telling public talk, public rhetoric is not just about convincing people of certain ideas. And it's not just limited to converting people. Christian public engagement is aimed at raising the affection of our hearers about all of the truth of God as high as we possibly can, provided that those affections are raised in proportion to the truth being proclaimed. So all truth affections as high as we possibly can in proportion to the truth being proclaimed. There's a lot of truth out there that a lot of Christians don't have any affection for. Their love of the truth grew dim. That's a warning that we ought to take very seriously. We need to learn to love the truth and to teach others to love the truth and hate what is evil, to hate wickedness, to hate error, and to admonish one another to do likewise. That is the heart of Lemix. Well, thank you, everybody who's watching and who will watch in the future and listen on the podcast. You can find our material at christianintellectual.com. You can support us by going to christianintellectual.com slash Patreon. We really do have this passion to change the direction that we see our churches and our nation going. And if we can equip you in any way, then we would love to hear from you. And keep us in your prayers because it is a spiritual battle. And uh, we, we received a very kind word from one of our supporters the other day saying that they were just thinking about the work that we're doing and appreciating it and praying for us. And the, the reason why we're doing this is because for a very long time, Jacob and I felt alone in churches. And we realized there's other people out there that are in the fog, but just like, just like we were before we met each other and before we met a circle of other friends that believe in the kinds of things that we believe in. You don't have to be alone. We're, we're creating this project so that you can use this as that beacon so that you can find other people that you're able to relate to so that you don't feel isolated intellectually, theologically, politically. So take advantage of what we're creating here. I mean, a lot of work goes into it and it's to be used. So find it at christianintellectual.com. And thank you for listening today. God bless.